Finding the best sounding version of the Beatles' White Album is no easy task. There are currently 800 versions listed on Discogs and thousands of copies for sale on eBay. But what's the best way to get the most out of this album? I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and with a little help from these, I'm going to tell you what I think are the top 10 best sounding White Albums. Over the past 40 years of collecting Beatles records and 30 years of selling them, I've listened to hundreds of copies of the White Album. And these are just some of the ones I listened to to make this video. For me, this album is one of their greatest and most challenging listens, and the task of finding the best sounding pressing, as I said, isn't easy. And because we all have different relationships with this album, it may turn out to be an impossible task. So what follows is just my opinion. And while you may not agree with my choices, I hope you have fun watching me discuss them. So let's kick off by addressing the elephant in the room. Number 10. The 2018 Remix. Now, despite it being on this list, I don't consider it to be one of the best sounding versions of this album. It's just a version, which of course I bought and listened to. Although I found it an entertaining listen and even enjoyed some of the remix tracks, I was disappointed by the overall sound and feel of it. And I wasn't the only one. Some said the whole idea was sacrilege, whilst others felt it had been mixed just for headphones or only to sound good on bad equipment. Now, I originally bought this set on CD, mainly because it was the only way to get the book. But a short time ago, I bought the vinyl version to see if it would change my opinion. The first impression I got when playing this was that the music sounded so distant, like it was being played through a plate glass window in another room, and I felt removed from the whole experience. So my first response was to turn it up, but that felt like I was really disappointed with the sound of this. It just lacks the presence and feel of every other pressing I tested. But I know from reading comments on previous videos that a lot of you enjoy this remix, and I get it. I actually think it's an entertaining listen on headphones, but in the end, I'll always go back to the original mix. But please do feel free to leave us a comment and tell us how you feel about it. Now, before we move on, some people have asked me which system I use to listen to records. Well, I don't have or believe it necessary to have an expensive setup to appreciate the differences between a good sounding record and a not so good sounding one. The main thing is to listen on a setup you know well. In my case, that comprises of a Project Debut Carbon Esprit turntable, which is fitted with an Autophon 2M cartridge with an Autophon Blue Stylus on it. That goes into a Riga Phono, Phono stage, which in turn goes into a Name Supernight integrated amplifier. My speakers are a pair of these neat petite bi-wired bookshelf speakers. And I also have a Tannoy TS-10 Sub. If you're interested in learning more about any of those, I'll put some links in the description. So with that out of the way, let's get back to the list and... Number 9 This is the 2009 remaster. It's like the remix, but without the... <laughs> Although all of the original elements are in place, its main disadvantage is that it was cut from a digital source, which does give it that glassy, uninvolving vibe. But it's the latest, and hopefully not, the last issue of the original mix. What we really need is an all analog stereo pressing, not just of this album, but the entire album catalog. And that's the missing piece in the Beatles musical story at the moment, as far as fans and collectors go. Why Apple didn't or doesn't believe there's a market for an analog stereo box set is beyond me. If there's one format the Beatles truly understood, it was mono and its importance to their fans. 
And even though it was a dying format in the UK in 1968, at least as far as albums were concerned, the Beatles put as much effort into mixing the White Album in mono as they did in stereo. In fact, they specifically made some of the mono mixes different on purpose. Although most people today are more familiar with the stereo mix, if you've never listened to this album in mono, I'd say you're missing out. Which is why the next three positions in my list are mono pressings. Number eight. Now for most, the 2014 mono is the go-to pressing when they want to listen to this album in mono. And who can blame them? It's a decent sounding, well-made pressing. However, I do find it slightly harsh in the upper mids and think it lacks the smooth, warm mid-range of Number seven. My first copy of this album was a mono one. This one, in fact, bought from a collector shop in Cambridge called The Beat Goes On in November 1980 for the grand sum of £9.99. Unlike all great mono mixes, it has an almost 3D-like quality and is my preferred way to listen to this album. The stereo mix, in my opinion, tends to magnify the album's different styles and sounds too much, whereas the mono mix provides a more cohesive and satisfying listening experience. But one of the issues as far as UK first pressings are concerned is that finding a clean sounding original is nearly impossible. There's so much to go wrong over the four sides. Groove wear, clicks, sibilance, you name it. Original copies have at least one or all of these faults. And if you do find a clean sounding one, it's going to cost you. So I think the next pressing on the list would be a better, if not the perfect mono choice. Number six. This 1981 mono pressing takes care of all of the issues presented by the previous two pressings. Firstly, it uses original 1960s cuttings, which have that all important upper mid range magic. Secondly, as copies were generally treated better than first pressings and were played on better quality equipment, they tend not to have so many wear issues. Thirdly, even though it's not what I class as cheap, it is cheaper than a first pressing and it's not that difficult to find. Finally, I've just got one thing to say to those mono naysayers out there. Alexa, play the White Album. Number five. As a rule, I like vintage things to be factory or stock, which is why the next item on my list is the 1987 CD. This is my copy, which I bought on day of release on August the 24th, 1987, and it's numbered 29,816. Now, back in the day when CDs were first becoming popular, many record companies just transferred their master tapes to digital flat without any EQing, remixing or anything. And that's exactly what happened in the case of the White Album. Whether you like it or not, the sound on these CDs is the closest you'll get to the sound of the mixes which are on the original master tape. It's everything the 2009 remaster and remix isn't. It's honest, pure and flat. And more importantly, like the mono, it's the mix the Beatles originally signed off. Now I know some find the original stereo mix a little harsh, and you could argue there's too much high end in places and the bass is a little wonky here and there. But that's exactly how it is, making this CD the purist's choice. If you want to take it up a notch for not much more money, seek out the 1998 30th anniversary issue. It's got much better packaging and corrects some of the indexing issues of the 1987 disc. But I bet you've already got this in your collection. So why not dig it out Give it a spin and let me know what you think. Number four. Just ahead of the CD, but only really because it's vinyl, is the UK stereo vinyl. Like the mono pressing, clean original UK first pressings are tough to find. But that task is made much easier by the fact that it was in print much longer than the mono. And if you're someone who's not bothered about low cover numbers, you'll be pleased to know that the original cuttings stayed in print well into the 1970s. For example, this early second pressing, which omits the sold in UK text, still has all Dash 1 matrices, as do these slightly later light green labeled copies. 
In fact, most pressings, right up until the early 1980s before everything went digital, sound great and were usually cut by the great Harry Moss himself. Number three. A few weeks ago on the channel, I reviewed the Rolling Stones in mono coloured vinyl box set and was quite taken aback at the number of negative comments, not about mono, but about coloured vinyl. It's true, coloured vinyl pressings sometimes have a higher noise floor than your regular black vinyl, but in many cases they can sound as good, or as in this case, better than their black vinyl counterparts. And this 1978 UK white vinyl pressing is a case in point. In an effort to boost stagnant sales of Beatles albums, EMI issued the red and the blue double albums on coloured vinyl in the UK in 1978. That same year, a further four albums were pressed on coloured vinyl too, but these were intended for export. They were Magical Mystery Tour on yellow vinyl, Abbey Road on green vinyl, and the White Album and Let It Be on white vinyl. The coloured vinyl craze spread to other countries too. France, for instance, where they released Sgt Pepper in eight different colours. For the white vinyl White Album, Instead of using existing metalwork, Harry Moss recut the entire album, which would be pressed not by EMI's factory in Hayes, but by a small company called Orlake in Dagenham, Essex, who specialised in picture discs and coloured vinyl. Although the vinyl was not up to the quality of EMI's best black compound, Harry Moss's cutting surpassed anything he'd done with this album to date. The sound really sparkles with a warmth and clarity missing from any other pressing of this album. And although you'll be lucky to find one cheap, I doubt you'll be disappointed. And now for something completely different. Number two. The early 1980s saw a revolution in vinyl manufacturing, or more specifically, how it was cut. Developed in the late 1970s by German company Teldec, DMM, or Direct Metal Mastering, involved cutting the grooves directly onto a copper blank instead of the traditional lacquer covered disc. EMI Electrola got on board pretty early on and began producing their own DMM discs in 1983, with EMI UK signing up to the process in 1984. The DMM process offered a number of advantages, not only to the manufacturing process, but also to the sound quality. Sides of an album could be longer without the risk of jumping or sticking. There was no end of side distortion or post or pre echo which is when you hear the faint trace of the track before it actually starts, a feature common to some original UK Beatles albums, especially for some reason, the mono rubber sole. Unlike EMI in the UK, EMI Electrola in Germany decided to take advantage of the new increased dynamic range ability of DMM and recut all of the Beatles original albums. The man responsible for these recuts was John Creamer, and the results of his work can be found on all German Press Beatles albums manufactured between 1984 and 1987. Now the Beatles' original EMI pressings aren't exactly what you would call dynamic, but Kramer did his best to put some life into them in, I guess, a similar sort of way Dave Dexter Jr. did at Capitol. However, Kramer was a much better technician using better technology, and the results were infinitely superior. However, he sometimes overcompensated and overshot the mark, resulting in wildly different results on the same album. But fortunately, the sonic characteristics of the White Album suited his treatment perfectly and the results were spectacular. His initial DMM cuttings bring out sound and textures that are buried or even non-existent on regular UK cuttings. It is, if you like, a kind of remaster, but more importantly, it's an analog one. Now, being a Teldec registered trademark, EMI weren't allowed to use the DMM logo straight away on their first DMM cuttings, but in most cases, these are identifiable by their uppercase label rim texts, like this. 
Also, the playing surface of a DMM pressing is much smoother than a regular lacquer cut. But I guess that doesn't really help you if you're looking online. So the main identification has to be done by looking at the matrix numbers, which on these early DMM pressings are A2, B3, A2, B2. Another feature which tells you if you have the analog DMM cut is the fraction of a second gap between Savoy Truffle and Cry Baby Cry on side four, which sounds like this. This analog DMM cutting also briefly appeared on the two EMI box Parlophone label, but without the DMM logo. The legendary 1984 German white vinyl, which because it was pressed by Teldec, does have the DMM logo on the label, sports the same mix, but with different matrix endings in plus slash slash D. However, this is not to be confused with the 1978 German white vinyl, which does not use the DMM cutting. So there's no need to pay a fortune getting the 1984 German white vinyl when you can get the same results from this black vinyl pressing for much less money. Now it's true that the sound of this DMM pressing isn't for everyone, but it's a lot of fun. And as with the remix, different is sometimes good, even if it doesn't mean better. Because of the limited time they were produced, they're not easy to find, making finding one on sites like Discogs quite difficult. However, I'll put a link in the description to the correct entry on that site. You're more likely to find them in BC13 box sets of this era, or at least you can experience all these incredible DMM cuttings in one go. We sometimes also have them on our website too, which you can find at parlogramauctions.com. But here's a word of warning. Don't be taken in by these DMM Parlophone labeled white vinyl copies. They're counterfeit pressings pressed in China. The covers look like this with a gray Beatles wording, which is flat and not embossed. Their runouts have machine stamped matrices, A2, B4, C1, D1, along with the word Abbey Road. But the giveaway is some Chinese characters, which translate as gold disc. They're also not 100% white. Number one. Now, when it comes to the sound quality of Beatles records, the UK pressings are the ones against which all others are measured. And in many cases, the UK analog pressings are the best. However, occasionally you come across one which takes you by surprise. Way back in October 2021, we made a video comparing six different editions of the BC13 box set, and the winner was the Dutch set. It won because it had, in my opinion, the highest number of best sounding pressings compared to the others. And one of the highlights of that set was its white album. Here it is on its pale green Apple label with the catalog number 1A13804173. It's not pressed on heavyweight vinyl. In fact, it's quite thin, only 113 grams, but its sound certainly isn't. Although the harsh mid-range of the UK first pressings improved on late 70s pressings, this Dutch pressing is much smoother and more detailed than all of those, but without being soft and flat. It's got a tight, well-controlled bass, which isn't as fat as the analog DMM we've just looked at, it's just so well balanced overall. This copy dates from the early 1980s and has glass onion misspelt as glass union. And the word gently on while my guitar gently weeps is also misspelt. I wouldn't worry too much about the matrices as they were all cut locally. And in my experience, they all sound as good as each other. As with many of the Beatles albums, I'm finding more and more that the late 70s, early 80s pressings, which many people got rid of, are now the ones to get. Forget 180 gram vinyl, that's just a marketing scam. These discs weigh much less and sound way better. And maybe the best news in these troubling times is that most of them are not as expensive as, and are usually in better condition than first pressings. Now, of course, that was just my opinion, and there are hundreds of other pressings out there that I've never heard. 
I'd love to know what you think is the best sounding version of this album, so do let me and everyone else know in the comments. I really hope you enjoyed this one and that you'll be back next week for some more Beatles madness. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. Number nine.